All right. Uh, can you hear me? ได้ยินไหมครับได้ยินครับได้ยินครับโอ้อ่ารออีกสักสองสามนาทีแล้วกันนะครับดูว่าคนจะเข้ามาเพิ่มหรือเปล่าเป็นไงบ้างทุกคนสัปดาห์แรกนิชาอื่นๆเรียนไหวไหมครับก็ก็ยังพอไหวครับก็ยังพอไหวโอเคอาจารย์ครับใช้ VM ทำงานได้ใช่ไหมครับวีเอ็มทำงานได้แล้วก็จริงๆแล้วผมคุยกับอาจารย์บาร์กแล้วอพอดีแกเจเนเรตเหมือนกับว่าไม่ใช่เจเนเรตรู้สึกเหมือนน้องทุกคนจะมีแอคเคาท์บนเซิร์ฟเวอร์แล้วเพราะฉะนั้นสามารถทำบนเซิร์ฟเวอร์ได้เลยครับอาจารย์บาร์กแจ้งมาว่าไม่ต้องใช้ไม่ต้องใช้วีเอ็มแหละก็ไม่ต้องใช้วีเอ็มก็ง่ายขึ้นง่ายขึ้นเยอะเพราะว่าก็ใช้ SSH เซไปที่เซิร์ฟเวอร์ได้เลยแล้วก็เดเวลลอปคนนั้นได้มันโค้ดเราส่วนมากมันจะเป็น <coughs> ดีเพนเซีหลักก็คือคอมไพล์ภาษาซีได้จบแล้วก็อีกตัวหนึ่งมันจะเป็นซิมูเลเตอร์ซิมูเลเตอร์ตัวนี้เดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวผมพูดให้ฟังก็คือมันมันมันสามารถเปลี่ยนโปรแกรมเราเป็น Assembly ที่เป็นภาษาที่เรียกว่ามิปส์มันไม่ใช่มันไม่ใช่เอ็กซ์เอ็ดิสิกแอสเซมบลีแต่มันจะเป็นมิปส์แอสเซมบลีมันคืออันเดียวกับที่ผมเคยพูดว่ามันใครไกในเอ่อเพลย์สเตชันอ่ะอันนั้นอ่ะทำได้เพราะฉะนั้นซิมูเลเตอร์มันจะทําอันนี้ให้เราพอเราได้โค้ดแอสเซมบลีที่เป็นภาษาที่เรียกว่ามิปส์เนี่ยปั๊บเราก็เอาไปฟีดเข้าไปในหลับเราได้แล้วหลับเรามีแต่ภาษาซีเป็นดีเพนเดนซีที่น้อยที่สุดในจักรวาลคอมไพล์ซีโค้ดได้จบพอโอเคมีใครมีคำถามอะไรเพิ่มเกี่ยวกับคาสไหมครับหรือว่าพวกแบบฟอร์แมตเป็นยังไงเอ่อกลัวเยอะงานเยอะอะไรมีมีคอนเซิร์นอะไรบอกผมได้นะครับโอเคเอ่าน่าจะคนกับครบแล้วไม่ครบผมก็ไม่แน่ใจว่าครบหรือไม่ครบเอาไงดีว่าเดี๋ยวอีกหนึ่งนาทีเริ่มกันเริ่มตอนบ่ายโมงห้านาทีแล้วก็ทุกคนในนี้เข้าคลาสเว็บไซต์ได้แล้วเนาะมันมีอีกอย่างหนึ่งก็คือผมยังไม่ได้วิดีโอจากทีมทางพี่แอดมินเลยก็เดี๋ยวผมว่าจะอาจจะต้องเช็คกับทางพี่พี่แอดมินฝั่งเว็บไซต์อีกทีหนึ่งว่าส่งวิดีโอให้ผมทางไหนได้บ้างเพื่อที่ผมจะได้ไปโพสนะครับเหมือนจะอยู่ใน MS t e a m มหรอไม่เนาะใครก็ได้ฝากโหลดให้ผมแล้วส่งไปไหนได้ผมผมโหลดไม่ได้ผมไม่มี permission เพราะว่าผมจำไม่ผิดไอ้ MS Team Link อ่ะมันจะ expire ในสองสัปดาห์รบกวนมีใครปอลันเทียหน่อยไหมครับเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวผมลองส่งให้ดูได้ครับเดี๋ยวจะเหมือนผมตอนนี้ผมพยายามจะไป access link มันไม่ให้เพราะว่าผมไม่มี permission เงี้ยเออโอเคเรามาเริ่มกันดีกว่าเนาะเดี๋ยวขอสลับเป็นภาษาอังกฤษอ่า alright so let's continue on from our first lecture uh we we will first well this is the format of this class going forward every time we have a new lecture I'm gonna do a review on the last lecture alright so let's go to uh, lecture one review and What we actually cover for lecture, and we talk about a lot, a lot about admin stuff. We talk a lot about uh, the history of computer, right? And and hopefully you find those things interesting and 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 
lightweight in a sense. It's not heavy in terms of content uh, since it's the first class. But the things that I want to make sure you follow is uh, if you look deeper, right? Uh, here is what here's what you will see in the computer. You have the processor. This is think of it as your brain where you are doing the actual action, right? Adding, multiplying, subtracting, X or and or any logical operation, even things like matrix multiply, most of the time is done in the processor. And you have the memory component, which contain your program and contains the data, right? And then at the kind of further end of the the, the processing side, you have the I.O., which is where you actually draw the data into the computer, right? It can be through your mod, uh, to your keyboard, through the touch screen, uh, touch screen on your monitor, <clears throat> through the file input and output, through the network interface card, right? So these are where you have to actually kind of funnel information into it, and these are the I.O. And as you can see, data are basically being transferred between all these three components. And we talk about the age of Moore's law, which actually the, the main key message is you're going to be able to have more transistor. And why is that good? The ability to be able to have more and more transistor as times go on is you can have more fancy logic, more and more fancy CPU. You have more transistor that you can use for different purposes. Okay, so for different purposes. So that's the key. And then we talk about how how do you process things. So let's say you have this program, right? In i equals zero, j equals twenty, and k equals i plus j. This is a program. Program will be processed through the compiler, and then when you run, the runtime system kicks in and say, "Hey, I have this program. I'm gonna put this program in main memory. Make sure I run this." The CPU will take this job. Saying, hey, OK, I got this program. Let me run this. The CPU and the program talk to each other through the ISA. And we learn today what is the ISA and what are the elements. Then the microarchitecture is the actual hardware that, that runs your program, which kind of like abstract away the rest of the compute stack, right? Logic devices, even electrons. You don't. You actually don't want to be able to control those things from the programmer point of view. Too much detail, right? Too much detail. And we talk about von Neumann versus data flow, where data flow program basically allows the execution of your program based on data, how data flow into each component. If I have all the data input ready, I'm going to fire off that execution and run it right away. It doesn't have to be the exact same order as the sequential program as you write that, right? And we kind of conclude that sequential program generally is more natural. The reason why we say that is most of the time we are trained to write sequential program. For those of you who write functional programming before, it kind of reflects the data flow side a little bit, but at the end of the day, most programmer would prefer sequential program at least as of now, right? at least how we train people to to be computer scientists and computer engineer. More than how we start with sequential program. So generally, they can be more natural, right? In your CPU, it allows you to write program in a sequential order, but convert this into the data flow inside the CPU itself. And we'll learn this in a few lectures. And we end the lecture with what is this? So any any taker here? Uh, so for those of you who solved this before, just type type this on the chat. So I'm gonna record your answer, and you're gonna get, as I said, extra credit based on what we have last last time. Actually, I'm not sure. Count number of ones. Count number of set bits. Uh. Ah. Okay. All right, some some of you got the right answer. Some of you don't actually. Some of you are close. Any 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 more taker before I say which one is correct? <clears throat> so 
So I think I'm going to give you guys, like, for those of you who didn't get it correctly, I'm going to give you partial credit because you get kind of like almost there. This compute. Okay, so <clears throat> what this does is it. All right, any more taker? Should I stop? Okay, let me let me let me stop here. If you if you don't have anything else, oh, it's all good. Okay, any any more any more answer here? I'm gonna copy and paste on my notepad so I know who answer what. All right, so let me stop here and copy this onto my notes so that I know exactly who answer what. So I can. Uh, So I can process it later. So I got everyone's answer. And by the way, thank you for, for responding. Uh, this is awesome. And this is not XOR. The first thing you do is, is XOR. What we do here is, is called Hamming distance. Anyone work on security or uh, uh, encryption encoding? Do you, do you know what is Hamming distance? Is it like how many bits do we need to change to make A match B? Exactly, yeah. So this is what it's computing. The way we process this is, what does XOR do? XOR, definitely what it does is it detects how many difference, how many bit difference, right, are there between A and B. So let's say A is 110110 and B is, I don't know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. What is the result of X or B, uh, A, X or B? It's going to be 1, 1. 0, 1, 0, 0. Whenever this, the bit is the same, whenever the bit is the same, it's going to be 0. Whenever the bits are different, it's going to be the number 1. So in this case, what's the Hamming distance? Three, right? So if you break this logic to just this part, it count the number of ones, right? So this is where I said there's a lot of great partial answer. This part count number of ones for uh for A, X, or B. It count number one for A, X, or B, but it's not the whole thing because you do first thing you do is the A, X, or B. You count number ones, which means that that's the number of bit flip that you have to do to match A to B. All right, so anyone have any question? So this is just a counter, right? And this is kind of like a logic that will keep going. And the each time you go, you get rid of one of the ones. The first time, the first time you go through this logic, you get rid of this, it becomes zero. The second time you get rid of this, becomes zero. Get the third time, this goes out and becomes zero. So it does have a loop because of two arrows. Let me change the color. This arrow is a loop. This arrow is a loop. It would go in that loop. All right. 
So any more questions about this example and why is this a Hamming distance? So for those of you who said X or you get partial credit, for those of you who said count the number of ones, you get partial credit, right? And if you get it correctly, even though it's just an algorithm format, you're gonna get full credit for the extra credit, all right? And the one that said count number one would get more partial credit than the ones that said X or because you can see XOR is definitely not the logic because there's a lot of things afterward, right? Okay, so let's go on to the content of this particular lecture. And we kind of discuss how, so let's put on this hat, right? Let's assume that you can design a hardware. How many times as a computer engineer or computer programmer or computer scientist, how many times you make that assumption that say, hey, I can change the hardware. Can 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 you raise your hand if you have that assumption before? That hardware can change. If you haven't made that assumption before, I hope throughout this course, right? Throughout this course, you have that assumption in mind that at the end of the day, Software is not the only thing that's changing. Hardware is changing too. How many of you buy a new iPhone, let's say every seven years or eight or whatever years that you feel like your old phone is dying? Who, who are waiting for, I guess, iPhone 13 that's gonna come out hopefully next month? All right, I see someone resting your hand, right? So this is nature as things progress, right? As things, as time progress, new and new hardware comes out, right? Uh, my GPU, my graphic cards are kind of old, but it's not too bad. I upgraded once already, right? My computer is more than 10, I bought it 2014. So my computer is about eight years old. My GPU is about three years old. I upgraded about five years in because I cannot play. Actually, to be honest, Anyone want to guess why did I buy a new GPU? Why did you buy a GPU? When, why did you upgrade your GPU? Why would any user upgrade your GPU? Yeah, to play games. I can tell you a story, right? Back around the time, I think Final Fantasy 15 come out, I still cannot buy the game because I don't have a lot of money, right? But when it goes on sale, I bought the game. And at around that time, that's when the Bitcoin thing kind of dies down a little bit. So GPU becomes actually normal price, not the jack up price that we see nowadays. It's just like absurd, right? So I'm like, okay, let me upgrade my GPU so I can play Final Fantasy 15 on my computer. That, and that's what it did. We upgrade the hardware all the time, right? So let's come back to the content of this whole course, right? As a programmer, you design a program. Why don't you take advantage of like, hey, maybe we can change the hardware too so that my program runs faster. What is one of the prime examples of that that apply to machine learning? How can I make machine learning run faster? with? With how GPU evolve, anyone see the, the the big new thing that comes out of this hardware changes? Including the part of the chip on your iPhone, it actually has special hardware for machine learning, right? Anyone heard of this thing called neural processor, TPU? TPU is a great example, exactly. Yes, thank you so much for, for replying. So. I hope uh, I hope we, we use the chat for your advantage. I actually have the, the, the monitor behind me to uh, monitoring the chat. And and thank you again. I like to thank everyone again to like make sure this class is at least more fun than just me talking. Right. So answer this question would be awesome. TPU is a prime example of how you can take advantage of new hardware, right? And it's a prime example of how 
us as a hardware engineer talk to the software guy like hey is that the workload you want to run oh it's the consist of metrics multiply so let me actually design a ship that do the metrics multiply really really fast right really really fast and just a snap of a finger half the population no that's what uh Thanos. with a snap of the finger you can do metrics multiply right and it's a lot faster than even running it on the gpu right so that that's the beauty of hey don't don't just assume you cannot change the hardware right it was kind of like a running joke that that a lot of people assume that hardware cannot be changed uh yes or no it would evolve over time and it's great if you can communicate with with people who design the hardware like this is what you want the, but first, the first step, let's come back to this lecture. Let's come back to this lecture now that we, we go sidetrack quite a bit. Uh, the only, the first issue is your computer is just electrical circuit, right? It's just electrical circuits. So can I walk to, I don't know, like any random electrical circuit, uh, circuit in my house and say, hey, turn on the lights or uh, I don't know, turn on the air conditioner without, without saying anything, I just say that word. Would it go on? More than have no, right? The first step for us to program, to be able to program is we need to be able to talk to the computer, right? We need to be able to talk to the computer. So, and if you think about it, right? Your, your computer doesn't really understand your command. You, you can't just say, int i equals zero and the computer right away would understand that what do you need to make sure the computer understand int i equals zero Well, you definitely need a logic gate, but how do you control the logic gate so that it knows that this is actually in i equals zero? <clears throat> you convert, right? You convert this to binary code, right? And even with binary code, zeros and one, right? Does my computer understand what does zero and one mean without me trying to do something with it? So first of all, anyone know, anyone want to take a guess why binary format is awesome for, for the computer? Why is this awesome for the computer? It, it, first of all, it, it does have a great uh, application on Boolean algebra and at the end of the day, you can do anything with Boolean algebra, right? So that's a great answer. The second great answer is open and close the switch, right? Open and close the switch. That's another great answer. If I run uh, current through my wire, so I, let's say I have a wires, right? And I have current, uh, current through it, right? What does it mean? It means I close the switch, right? I have current going through the wire. So if I measure the voltage, what's the value of that? Let's say the value is V, right? Voltage. Over time, right? And let's say this is V. And let's say this is what I measure over time. And let's say I, if I make this assumption, if I see something close to V, that's a value one. If I see something close to zero, that's a zero, right? So this whole thing becomes, this whole thing becomes a method. One, zero, one, one, zero, one, right? Now with just the voltage value and time, with just the voltage value and time, I can convert this signal into binary number, right? Can I have this 
voltage over time running on my circuit. One like high, low, high, high, low, high, 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 low, high, high. Can I do that? So with a combination of different switches I have, right? I can do it, right? Yeah, I can just close and open and close and open and somehow you got the message, right? You got the message. And this is kind of similar to Morse code, right? When you say open, it can be like that dash line and close is the dot, right? So if you say dash, dot, dot, dash, dash, it would, well, I don't know Morse code, but it can mean something, right? So we can do the same trick and represent this in binary number. And because we said binary number has a close relationship with Boolean algebra, we can emulate Boolean algebra with binary number, right? And what's more than that? Once you have Boolean algebra, you can say there's a there's a law, right? That say if you can do and or and not, and or and not. You can do more, well, not, you can do any mathematical operation to make your computer Turing complete. Basically, you, you now have a functional computer, right? Now you have a functional computer. Here you can do and, or, and not. But let's go beyond that, right? Let's go beyond just, hey, I have a computer. Let's actually be able to talk to the computer, right? You, you don't, you don't want just a calculator. A calculator is good, but you want to be able to program it. Right? So our idea is, hey, let's represent relatively human language, things like Python, Java, and C, those instruction. Why don't we represent that in binary format, right? So that every single piece of the command becomes binary. Every single piece of the data becomes binary. So, and then we use this as an interface between assembly code and the computer. All right. So, any question on the slides? So, any language is fine. You can ask me in Thai, you can ask me in English. I just want to make sure the message get across. Um, Oh, that, 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 that. Okay. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'm going to do the translation in Thai. So to make sure everything is clear, right? ก็คือจริงๆแล้วอ่ะถ้าลองบอกว่าเออเราเราไม่รู้จะสั่งแล้วถ้าผมตีต่างอยู่ดีเนี่ยผมพูดภาษาเยอรมันไม่เต็มแล้วผมเดินไปลันดอมอยู่ในประเทศเยอรมันแล้วคุยกับคนที่พูดภา
คือบางเครื่องเขาอาจจะใช้วนแต่ศูนย์เป็นเลขศูนย์ก็ได้นะคือแล้วแต่เครื่องแล้วแต่เครื่องอันนี้คือแล้วแต่ชิปแล้วแต่ดีแรมอะไรพวกนี้มันมีเทคนิคในการประหยัดไฟอะไรแบบคือคือแล้วแต่เทคนิคแต่ว่าคร่าวๆก็คือค่าหนึ่งจะเป็นเลขหนึ่งค่าหนึ่งจะเป็นเลขศูนย์พอเราทําอย่างนี้ได้ปั๊บเราสามารถแทนเป็นค่าไบนารีได้พอเราแทนเป็นไบนารีได้สมมุติเรามีคอมไพเลอร์คอมไพเลอร์ทําอะไรให้เราครับคอมไพเลอร์ทําอะไรให้เราสมมติว่ run GCC right let's say we run GCC on our program we yeah we just basically compile a map right map whatever we write in the program into assembly and then they do a lot more things so if you if you any of you guys work on compiler and programming language and you want to kill me because I just said that uh, don't, please don't do that I, I am aware that it's not the only thing the compiler do But one of the main thing the compiler has to do is to change your code into the machine language. Exactly, right? It change your code to the machine language. Anyone here work with microprocessor or embedded system before? มีใครเคยต้องทำแบบ embedded system project อะไรอย่างี้ไหมครัเขียนพวก microprocessor. Yeah. So if you had, right? If you had. Have you used the ARM processor before? The one that has that that is manufactured by company that use ARM, rather than uh, rather than say a typical x86 computer. Oh, uh, pick yeah, pick is is another one, right? So if you, what will happen if I take binary that run on my laptop which use Intel x86? Put it on pick and try to run it. What will happen? Will it run? Will that binary run? The answer is it will not. Right? The steps that you have to do is to convert to convert the assembly from Intel chip into pick, so that it run on pick. Right? Uh, let me translate that in Thai just to make sure things are clear. ก็คือถ้าสมมุติเรามีแอสเซบไบนารีของของของที่เราคอมไพล์เสร็จแล้วสําหรับคอมพิวเตอร์ที่มันใช้ Intel X86 เป็น Assembly เป็นภาษา Assembly เนาะแล้วเราบอกเปรี้ยวอยากเอาไปรันบนพิกหรือเราอยากเอาไปรันบนเอ่อชิปที่มันใช้ ARM Processor เนี่ยหรือหรือเราจะไปรันบน MacBook ที่มันเป็น M1 อ่ะแล้วไม่ทําอะไรเลยสั่งรันดื้อเนี่ยมันจะรันไม่ได้ M1 มันจะรันได้แต่มันต้องใช้ตัว Translator อันหนึ่งที่แปลงอีกทีให้มันกลายเป็น ARM Assembly อันเนี้ยคือหนึ่งในปัญหาที่เราต้องเจอเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวผมจะ discuss ต่อไปในสไลด์ต่อๆไปนะ so let let me proceed to the slide because we have a lot of slide today uh, the first thing I, that I guess that's the first thing I want to make sure you are aware the second thing that I want to make sure you are aware is there's a difference between ISA and micro pro, uh, micro architecture right ISA or instruction set architecture Is the list of command that the micro architecture understand? The micro architecture is the hardware. That's the hard actual hardware components along with any optimization to make your computer faster. And the micro processor, the micro processor or micro chip or CPU <laughs> that you buy or the GPU, right? Those micro processor as we know it is the Combination of the ISA and the microarchitecture, and this become the interface. This become the middleman between your software and the circuit. This is how your software can talk to the circuit and say, "Hey, do this add or do factorial or do Fibonacci function or do whatever you want to do in your program, right?" So today we focus on the ISA. What is ISA? It contains first of all instruction, right? Instruction is the command. What what does instruction mean in English? In English language, what if I say the word instruction? I look it up on a dictionary. What would it mean? <coughs> It would kind of like probably say something like it's a sentence that has the command that tell someone to do something, right? And that's exactly what we want, 
right? So instruction would consist of, first of all, what we call opcode or operation code. Basically, that would tell what is this operation. Add, subtract, multiply, jump, branch, uh, load data from the main memory, store data to this location at this address. It would have addressing mode and the data type will expand into these. Addressing modes can differ across different ISA. Some of them is two addressing, some of them is three addressing. We will see the example of that. It would have instruction type and the format. It, it will have the type and the format, right? It would have the register and the condition code. And we'll talk about these components one by one today. On top of instruction, it would have the rule that govern how you control the memory, right? The DRAM that you buy from a computer store, when you plug that on the motherboard, the ISA would tell, how do I control it? How do I use it? How do I access that? It would have the discussion of how do you manage the address space? Anyone here know what is an address space? Can you help me out and list the definition? Anyone here seen this word before? Can you raise your hand? All right, so what what is your interpretation of the address space? Don't worry, just 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 say something. I mean, I'll if it's correct, awesome. Is it slightly correct? I'll make sure that I'll clarify that for everyone else. And yeah, so it's the space where your program can store, right? Can store the data. And each program when you run, it should have its own address space. It should have its own address space. Otherwise, it can be bad because let's say I run Microsoft Word and Dota 2, and somehow I do something in Microsoft Word, it touched the data that Dota 2 is running, and somehow I lose the game, right? So you will need to figure out how do you manage, how do you manage the address space? Where's the location that you're going to put your program in there? Where's the location in DRAM where you put your program's data in there? How do you control who can access what? It would have addressability. How do you add access? Do you want to give access to each byte or do you go to each word and things like that? You have things like alignment. You would have to include the virtual memory management. We'll expand into virtual memory uh, quite a lot in the second half of the class when we talk about the main memory, right? On top of this, also contain um, documentation over how do you handle system call, interrupt, exception handling, so can can someone tell me what's the example of a system call? So can can someone give me an example of a, of a system call? Yeah, it can be a function call. It can be any call, but basically as it, the name suggests, it's a call that's generated through the system, right? Uh, in what is the exception? Anyone? run into exception uh, call before? I think most people that you have to write code for, right? you have to actually draw exception whenever you don't really know what to do with the certain error, right? So you try to catch the exception or draw it and say, hey, there's an exception here. Access control, how do you actually allow people to access uh, each other data? It would have priority and privilege, right? Does the process have high and low priority? How do you manage the priority? How do you manage the I.O.? How do you manage the threat? And how do you manage even things like power and thermal, right? Uh, anyone here heard about this? I think it's actually ended up being a lawsuit uh, for Apple, right? That say Apple, 
intentionally slow things down to save the battery or something along that line. Have, have you heard about that on the news? I think about two years back. Right, so for those of you who heard, like if, if you read uh, technology news about two years back, there was a quite a big story back uh, in the day. And from us, from the architectural point of view, it was like, hey, that's the default thing that every single processor does, actually. Why is that the case? Do you happen to know what happened to the battery if you use the battery for a long time? Like five years or three years. So if I use my phone battery and I use my phone for five years, what would happen to my battery? It's going to decay, right? It's physics. <laughs> it's nature. So you're not going to have as much capacity. So Apple designer, well, App Apple engineer say, hey, what would make sense to make sure you can still use the phone for one day? Day rather than one hour. I'm going to make your phone a little bit slower so it consumes less power. So your phone lasts for the whole day, right? Which one makes more sense? Do you have, do you want a phone that is a, maybe five to 10% slower, but it lasts one day? Or a phone that performs at the normal speed, but it lasts one hour? Which one do you like? So ISA give you that option for the system to control this, right? If the system has a control over how you're gonna change the power input so that it actually consume different energy, right? So in this case, uh, I, I, I draw the example of like, okay, this is something that, that the ship allow you to do. And most of the time, this is the correct design decision, right? Uh, it does end up being a lawsuit, but at the end of the day, it, it makes a lot of sense. Right? Uh, from the micro architecture point of view, as I said, the micro architecture is the hardware. So the I guess I define what the software can do. These are the things that the program can can utilize. Right? This is the language that talk to the computer. The micro architecture have to implement everything on the ISA, right? The micro architecture, so basically, depending on the ISA, if you have the command that do an add, the hardware need to be able to do an add. If there's a command to multiply two metrics, I need to make sure I have a hardware to multiply two metrics. Otherwise, when the software call that command, the hardware can be like, oh, I don't know how to do that. If the ISA says something, you have to implement that. The micro architecture is the implementation of these things. These are transferred to software in this uh, in throughout this course. We will talk about most of these topics except for the last two. We will talk about how we change the hardware to make these techniques and it would work with any program without the programmer noticing, but the CPU is faster or the GPU is faster or we come up with a totally new hardware, right? So now that you have the ISA and micro architecture trade-off, right? Uh, what's the trade-off between having a more complex or different design in the ISA? For example, Anyone here familiar with the TF32 format? Anyone here used the GPU before and used this TensorFlow32? Anyone at all? Uh, have you have you tried this before? Exactly. So 
if you've watched the one of the launch uh, material for the A100, A100 is a, one of the more like a server grade, like a, a high performance computer GPU for the GPU for HPC, right? Uh, it's one of the newest one. Uh, it is currently the newest one. It released the new floating point format that say is called TensorFlow 32, which is kind of like a PR stunt bullcrap. Uh, do you know what is floating point 32? So FP32 is used for floating point number. How many bits are in the FP32 format? Thirty-two bits. So anyone anyone want to take a guess what, what is TF32? What are the differences between FP32 and TF32? So what NVIDIA claim is this particular design decision is they add one more data format. It means that the GPU has to support this data format. You can use it. The TF32 format cover the same range. It would cover the same range as floating point 32, but it won't be as accurate. It's actually not even for TensorFlow. It's like a, it's a floating point number used by the A100 card, and it actually used 19 bits, right? So, I mean, to be honest, why don't you call it tender float 19? Do we, like, the number should actually represent a number of bits, so that's a PR stunt that I disagree with. Uh, with the difference under the hood is if you are family is flo with floating point number, right? If you are family with floating point number, here's what happened. So this is FP32. You have the sign bit, right? This basically tell whether it's a negative or positive number. You have this section called exponent bit, and this is the mantissa bit. Exponent is kind of like I'm going to multiply something by 2 to the e, and e is not the actual bit that represent in decimal. It's, it's actually start from, I think, uh, if this is 8 bits, right? So it would be a 2 to the 7 minus e, or minus the, the representation of exponent, but it's something along that line. Right, it will be two to the e multiplied by m, and the mantissa bit specify what is m. The mantissa bit specify what is m, and this is done by this is essentially one plus one half plus one fourth plus blah blah blah. Right, so it's a series of two to the negative one plus two to the negative n, represent by the mantissa bits. And overall, right, overall, this is 32 bit long. TF32 said this, I'm going to have, again, the sign bit. I'm going to have the same number of exponent bit, but I'm going to ship out on the mantissa bit. It's going to be about that long. So the difference under the hood is you lose the accuracy. The number that you're going to represent will be not as accurate as the number in floating point 32. You lose the accuracy. But what you gain is power efficiency and the likelihood that maybe you can pack more things with just 19, I think it's 19 bits. So why does it work for machine learning? Why is it okay to lose some accuracy? Anyone, any taker? Why is it okay for me to lose some accuracy?
Y- yes and no, right? No, as in like, it's okay to lose accuracy because the nature of machine learning workload, do you need that much accuracy to train your model? You don't, exactly, you don't need high precision floating point for machine learning. So the more, it's more likely that you're okay with just 19 bits, right? But you are likely to gain speed up or power efficiency. So it's actually, it's a good design, right? It is a good design. My only complaint about this is like, why don't you guys say it's TF19? The, the number would represent number of bits. There's nothing new in here. It's not a lot of things new in here, right? And they're like, oh, this is like groundbreaking. I'm like, no, not really. Uh, the ISA would also determine the number of register, right? In both 86 and ARM ISA, it would have different number of register. It would also have different number of ports to the register files. Right. What is a register? Anyone here do not know what is a register? Can you? Okay. So for those of you who don't know what is a register, do you mind if I say the definition in Thai to make sure everyone is on the same page? Is it okay? All right. Awesome. Uh, register, ครับก็คือให้คิดซะว่ามันเหมือนเป็นตัวแปรที่ เอาไว้เก็บค่าแล้วมันเร็วมากๆเพราะมันอยู่บนซีพียูเลยแค่นั้นเลยก็คือเอาไว้เก็บค่าเหมือนเทมป์อ่ะเวลาเราเขียนโ
even though it's the exact same program. And if I have the binary for x86, I want to run it on an ARM processor, it won't run. <laughs> it will not run. And in lab number one, you see what it means to have a totally different binary because it, it basically is governed by this documentation that say, okay, the add would have this. The multiply would have this pattern. It would have a different pattern. So if you migrate to a new ISA, you're going to have to re-optimize the compiler right, for the new ISA. Another thing you can do is called code transformation. So this is, uh, if you've done it well, then you can release a new ship that uses a different ISA and run the same program. For example, in the Apple uh, computer that uses the M1 chip, right? Uh, it has this thing called Rosetta that would kind of do the, allow you to run the program that I've written for X86, for Intel and uh, AMD ships, right? On the M1 processor. Is that good or is that a, hey, how many, how many of you here owns an M1 processor uh, MacBook? Can you raise your hand? Do you find it sometimes annoying <laughs> with the Rosetta and like making sure things run? You can just say yes or no. I just want to get your opinion, actually. So yes, me and that can be annoying, right? So this is exactly why, right? Why? In conclusion, you don't want to end up with a lot of ISA, right? Think about it this way. If you look at human language, if I can give you a choice between being an expert in Thai language versus being an expert in English, which one do you pick? Which one would you like more? It's likely to be one that's more universal, right? Which is English. Because at the end of the day, I, I want to be able to communicate to everyone else in the world, right? So in conclusion, you don't, it ideally, you, you want the ISA to converge into a few languages, right? Otherwise, this can be annoying because let's say you go to a different country and you can only speak Thai and English, and then you fly into China, what would happen? Or you fly into Japan, what would happen? You're not going to be able to enjoy, right? Everything that the country give to you, right? How many people here been to Japan? So are, so for those who've been to Japan, don't you kind of, do you, can, can you speak uh, Japanese? Let me ask, like rephrase the question, right? How many more things can you do with, with the, if you somehow can speak Japanese really well, would you be able to enjoy your, your travel more in that case? Because you're going to be able to use a lot of things that Japanese give to you. Is that a yes or a no? Probably, right? You can probably maybe discover some uh, local restaurant that, that you cannot really tell because you cannot really speak Japanese that are good, right? So at the end of the day, translating from one language to another has the overhead. It is not free. It's not free. So you don't want a lot of ISA. And the code transformation and the recompilation, they all come with overhead. So that's one of the reasons why at the end of the day, if you look at modern process, you don't have a lot of ISA. There's x86, there's ARM, and there's RISC five, which came out, and hopefully it kind of like also becomes another major one as well. And here is the trade-off, right? Each ISA would give you a different amount of complexity of each instruction. It would tell how do I specify adding, multiplying, making sure I add this number and that number, 
making sure I only add the first two bytes rather than the first four bytes. It will support certain features of your ship. Low power ship. Uh, microprocessor that doesn't have a lot of memory. It can support SIMD or it can support SIMD plus simultaneous multi-threading, which is the GPU. So the type of ISA in general, right, in general, this is a really, really, really generic way to structure this because there's more elements to the ISA that we, we, are, we are not going to cover. But in general, you got looking into two different kind of like a school of how to design the ISA. The first one is called CISC or the complex ISA. Uh, example of that is at a six. Or at risk, reduce ISA. These examples are, for example, the MIPS ISA that we're going to use for the lab or the RISC-5, which is another popular ISA because it's open and it's really extensible. Okay, so you can, if you want to build new ships, it can be written in RISC-5 ISA, and you can take the design. The researcher who came up with the RISC-5 ISA will not charge you in any money, right? And here is what goes into the instruction. The instruction is the most basic element of the, the interface between the software, piece of software that you write, and the hardware that you buy, right? the computer that you have on uh, at home or on your laptop or in your lab, right? And the main component consists of two main things, opcode, overran. For example, if I say add R0, R1, and R2, I can assume, so translate to Thai quickly, อันนี้คือผมจะตีต่างเป็นตัวอย่างทั้งหมดเลยนะครับมันไม่ใช่ของจริงแต่ผมด้วยความที่ผมสามารถดีไซน์ได้อ่ะผมจะตีต่างในท
top. What's the number will I get? What's the result of this? Anyone want to take a guess? It's actually just operate like a stack. So this is called the stack machine. This is the example of the zero address machine. I don't need the operand. I just say pop and push. And I say pop what, push what. And yes, I will get 90 as a result. I can do accumulator. So over here, you see add and multiply. Doesn't take any operand. Is an add without any operand. Accumulator machine, the difference is you can do operation and accumulate, then load and store. For example, I can say load 10, increment A, so load load A, and then 10 is here, right? Then and I say deck increment A, increment A, store. A. The result would be I'm going to take value 10, increment it twice, store it back. Are these annoying? Are these annoying? So it's, it's really simple, by the way. It's really simple. The only thing you can do is like simple thing, add, multiply without any operand. But is this annoying? So if I ask you to write assembly with using zero address or one address machine, that would be annoying, right? So modern ISA would either use two address or three address machine. The example of two address machine is X86. This is how it works. You can do add EAX, ECX, for example. The ECX and EAX are the register name. It's just the name that I, the X86 use to say, hey, that's a register. These basically means that I'm going to add EAX plus ECX, and then I'm going to store the result into ECX. So the destina oh, destination in here act as a second source. Three address machine is even more convenient. I can say add R0, R1, and R2. And in this case, I would say I'm going to add R0 and R1, write the result into R2, right? So now that you might have questions, then what is, what is the trade-off? Why do I even want to use a two address machine rather than a three address machine? It seems more convenient, right? The key here is code size. Sometimes you want to make sure the code fit in your microprocessor. Sometimes the machine and the ISA is invented way back in the day, like 86. So you need to use, use the same thing. Number of executed operation. With the three address machine, it's likely to have contain the smallest number of operations to do whatever you want to do, right? All right, so let me do a quick pause here and ask if you have any question. And again, you can ask in Thai and in English. คือสองมันภายในน้อยกว่าจะจะจะสั้นกว่าเพราะว่าเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวพอถึงจุดที่ผมจะคอนเวิร์ทให้มันเป็นไบนาเรียเราจะเห
is the action she's adding. Right? So that's it. It's actually the reason why this went fast. That's it. The action are the opcode is the code that determined the, the, the action. The overran, the overran is like, what do, whom do I do the action to? And that's all, right? That's all. That's another great question of how do processor manage power consumption? Uh, so think, so I'm going to go sidetrack a little bit because this is not really uh, rele relevant to the content of this lecture. So I'm going to go super sidetrack. So the question that how to process and manage power consumption, you need to think about it this way. Most of the time, the source of power draw comes from when you have to flip the bit from zero to one or one to zero, or you do any operation like and or multiply, you have to actually give the power to those component, right? So in general, right, in general, when you have to manage the power consumption, right, when you have to manage the consumption, power consumption, you basically control the number of things like bit flips or active component that you have to work on that operation. ก็คือถ้าเป็นไทยก็คือพอเรามีบิดฟลิปจากศูนย์เป็นหนึ่งหนึ่งเป็นศูนย์เนี่ยมันจะใช้ไฟหรือว่าถ้าสมมุติผม
certain function call to say matrix multiply or convolution or loading array, right? But with reduced instruction, you have simpler hardware because because as as you design the hardware, you only have to implement whatever the ISA tells you to do. So if it can only do add multiply, just make sure the hardware can do that. Then you have hardware to perform simple instruction. Then the rest of the transistor can be used to optimize those things, to make sure add is really fast, to make sure multiply is really fast, to make sure you have a lot of caches. Right, so you can use the spare transistor to speed things up. It gives you a lot of compiler optimization because the compiler would have to analyze the code and translate to really simple instruction. We should then come to the topic of semantic gap, but before we go into that, any question? All right, any questions on the slides and, and the trade off between CISC and RISC? Uh, if you have questions, uh, we'll do a break in, let's say, about 10 minutes. So let's, oh, so we use complex instruction to do more complex tasks, right? Yes. Uh, complex ISA, you can use the instruction to do complex tasks. The downside of that, it, it means that if I have that instruction, it means I need to implement the hardware for that. So you have to dedicate more transistor to do certain tasks. Most of the time, if you know what you need, this is good, right? If you know, okay, I need metric on reply and I always have to use metric on reply, it makes a lot of sense. But if I want to use complex ISA for just a day-to-day -day computer, sometimes I might not even call that function ever, right? I might not even call this function ever. So basically you're wasting transistor to implement these functionality, but you never use it, right? So that's a trade-off between those uh, uh, thing that, that, that uh, was brought up here, all right? So let's do a five minutes break. Is that okay? Uh, CISC ISA is for, well, it's not really for specific hardware. It is a, it's a style of how you design an ISA, right? It's a style of how you design an ISA. Someone can say, there was a long debate right back in the 70s, actually. This is a long debate. It's like, should we use a CISC ISA or should we use a RISC ISA? It's like a mini war going on inside the architecture community. Uh, give me a second, give me a second. Give me a second. Peter, um, 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 can't Sorry. Yeah, I have. Mất mất chỉ là ta bị mày không. Oh, tiếng hải. Cảm ơn đi, cảm ơn đi, cấp. Uh, so let me recap again, right? The the complex instruction. It basically means that if they are complex and added there, and I never use it. Let's say the program never ever use this instruction, right? It will mean that I I have to implement the transistor dedicated for that particular function call, but I never use it. So some people who support risk ISA was like, why are you wasting transistor that way? Because I can use it to make sure my program run faster in a different way. I can make a multiply faster. I can make an adder faster. I can make the program that behave in certain way faster. So it's a debate between which format do we use, which particular type of ISA should we use. And here's a trade-off, basically what I listed here. 
Do you want fancy instruction to do a lot of fancy things? If you know exactly what you need, that's awesome. If you don't, then you are likely sometimes you're not using those functionality, right? Any questions? Please, ma'am. Otherwise, I'm gonna go through the semantic gap quickly, and then we'll take a break, right? So the semantic gap. Do you, anyone here familiar with the word semantic? Okay, it seems not. You heard about this uh, syntax, right? And semantic. Have you seen this before? Syntax error and something, something, something. Exactly, yes, awesome. So I'm going to compare this to English, right? This is or, or Thai even, right? Syntax. Think of this as grammar in English. Semantic is the meaning behind whatever you're writing. So if I give you a paragraph, if I give you a paragraph, a syntactically correct paragraph, it means that it doesn't violate any grammatical rules, right? A and uh, is correct. Subject verb agreement is correct. It's just grammatically correct. Can I write? Can I write a paragraph? Yeah, sorry, paragraph that has correct grammar but has no meaning. Can I do that? Yes. Right. So a program will have both the syntax elements and the semantic elements. Semantic gap means that when I write a program, how how far are the meaning for different layers? When you talk about the ISA, when you talk about the ISA, then this is the gap between the software and the ISA. A large semantic gap is I write a program and the ISA doesn't even give you add or multiply. It basically gives you hey, control this electron this way, control this transistor this way, and that's it. It basically means now there's more work for a compiler, more work for the compiler to actually compile your program. Small semantic gap means I'm going to give the ISA at a really high level, right? It might be able to do function call or to do Fibonacci right away, right? This allow more application specific hardware optimization, for example, I might want to include, say, a function that do metrics multiply. It close up the semantic gap. And the translation between one ISA to another ISA is basically changing the semantic gap. And this can be done both in hardware and software. All right. Uh, let's us take a break here. Is that okay? Let's just take a break and we will resume at 2.30 because it feels like there's quite a lot of questions. We actually went through a bunch of material. Uh, I'm going to use this time to answer questions. Is that okay? So give me two minutes. I'm going to get uh, some more water and I'll be right back around 2.27 and we will do Q&A. Is that okay? สองนาทีนะครับแล้วเดี๋ยวกลับมาเอ่อมีคำถามอะไรถามได้เดี๋ยวผมจะกลับมาประมาณบ่ายสองยี่สิบเจ็ดแล้วก็เดี๋ยวเรากลับมาสอนต่อบ่ายสองครึ่งโอเคนะครับ All right go get coffee I I'm sure you are all tired <laughs>
โอเคมีใครมีคำถามอะไรไหมครับเอออยากให้อาจารย์ผมยังไม่เก็ตก็เอาเอาคนไหนก่อนเอาเอาเอาก่อนเลยครับเชิญเลยครับเชิญเลยครับเออขอบคุณครับคือผมยังไม่เก็ตตรงรัสเซมันติกแกรนะโอเคเออเอาเอาเอาภาษาไทยหรือภาษาอังกฤษดีมี preference ไหมครับไหนๆมันก็เป็นคีย์เวิร์ดภาษาไทยโอเค semantic gap อ่ะมันเหมือนกับว่ามันเป็นช่องว่างระหว่างการที่จะเราจะให้ความหมายจากโปรแกรมอ่ะในใน context ของ architecture เนาะจากสมมุติเรามีโค้ดอันนึงอ่ะแบบโค้ดที่เขียนในภาษา C ฮะกับตัว ISA ที่คือภาษา assembly ใช่ไหมถ้ามี semantic gap เยอะก็แปลว่ามันมีแกลบอันเนี้ยกว้างๆคือโปรแกรมอยู่ตรงเนี้ย assembly อยู่ตรงเนี้ยอยู่ติดติด circuit เลยคือแบบทางนี้จะเป็น add multiply อาจจะเป็นบอกไปเปิดสวิตช์ตัวนี้ไปปิดสวิตช์ตัวนี้เหมือนเหมือนสมัยก่อนให้นึกภาพคอมพิวเตอร์ตัวใหญ่ๆที่มันใช้สวิตช์อะเนี่ยใช่ป่ะครับก็แบบเสียบสวิตช์ตรงนี้เสียบสวิตช์ตรงนี้นี่คือ assembly เราแบบต้องบอกให้เราต้องไปเสียบสวิตช์ปักไหนปักไหนอะไรเงี้ยไอ semantic gap อย่างเงี้ยใครใครจะเป็นคนที่ทํางานหนักที่สุดคนที่ทํางานหนักที่สุดคนที่ซวยที่สุดในในกรณีนี้คือคอมไพเลอร์เพราะนึกออกใช่ไหมครับเพราะว่าคอมไพเลอร์จะเป็นคนคอมไพล์ภาษาโปรแกรมเราอะให้มันกลายเป็นแบบคําสั่งพวกนั้นให้ได้อะเราด้วยความที่แกลบมันใหญ่มากคอมไพเลอร์ก็เลยบอกเฮ้ยคือมันไม่ใช่กลายเป็นแอดมัลติพลายแล้วเราต้องไปนั่งสับสวิตช์ทีละตัวคอมไพเลอร์จะต้องทํางานตรงนั้น small semantic gap มันเหมือนกับว่าสมมุติเรามีคําสั่งบอก Add multiply อะไรดีละเสร็จแล้วมีคําสั่งด้วยอ่ะทำถ้าจะทำฟิบโบนัคชีใช้คําสั่งนี้ถ้าจะทํา multiply matrix multiply จะอันนี้ array add vector add ทําอันนี้ใช้คําสั่งนี้ก็จะเป็นเราจะปิดปิด semantic gap คือมันเป็นช่องว่างระหว่างตัวโปรแกรมที่เราเขียนนะฮะกับตัว ISA คือคำสั่งที่เราใช้ได้ใน assembly เท่านั้นเองครับคอมครับอ่ so yes that's a, that's a great question that's a great question that's a trade off so the trade off is if you have a small semantic gap it means that You have to also implement the hardware to run that i like that command too. So let me let me translate that in Thai, right? So, มุนว่าน้องมีคำสั่งบอกว่าต้องเอา vector add มี ISA แบบ assembly assembly code ที่แบบ support ว่าถ้าทำเนี้ยมันจะสามารถ add array นี้ array นี้ได้ด้วยความที่มันมี ISA ก็แปลว่า hardware ต้อง implement ฟังก์ชันเนี้ยคือมันจะต้องแบบเอา transistor มามาก้อนหนึ่งบอกว่าโอเคเอาก้อนนี้แหละมาทำ implement add vector สองตัวนอกใช่ป่ะครับแล้วเสร็จแล้วปัญหาคือ transistor ที่มีในชิปแบบมันมีจำกัดถ้าเราสมมุติมี transistor ได้สิบล้านตัวแล้วเราบอกว่าเอา transistor มาแสนตัวมาทำแค่คำสั่งนี้คำสั่งเดียวอะ่ะจะเกิดอะไรขึ้นคือก็แปลว่ามี transistor เหลือแค่เก้าล้านเก้าเก้าล้านเก้าแสนตัวที่เอาไปทำอย่างอื่นได้เพราะฉะนั้น small gap เนี่ยก็คือมีข้อดีข้อเสียทุกอย่างเป็น trade off แล้วกัน uh, most most likely yeah so the question is does it mean that you have complex instruction you will have a large semantic gap uh, and reduce instruction is smaller gap it let me say that it depends it depends but generally yes generally yes Basically, the more instruction you add in the complex ISA, is trying to close the semantic gap, and while basically the reduced ISA would actually say, "Hey, compiler, do your job, <laughs> and hope for the best." I'm g o i n g to use the transistor on my chip to do something else. Uh, so the call back in Thai. Now, this is small gap. Ah, the fact that we need to add transistor to implement, right? Actually, compiler said, "Okay, run this command, this command, this command, yeah, job." แต่ถ้าเป็น reduce i s a อ่ะมันก็จะบอกว่าโอเคฮาร์ดแวร์จะให้คำสั่งที่เบสิกเบสิกพวกนี้ให้นะแล้วคอมไพเลอร์ต้องเป็นคนไปคิดเอาไว้ว่าจะออปติมายยังไงเสร็จแล้วทรานซิสเตอร์ที่เหลือทรานซิสเตอร์ที่เหลือเพราะชิปเราก็สมมติที่ผมบอกตัวอย่างเมื่อกี้มันมีทรานซิสเตอร์สิบล้านตัวเท่ากันอะ่ะแล้วก็จะมีทรานซิสเตอร์เหลือใช่ไหมไอ้ที่เหลือเราจะไปทำอย่างอื่นที่ทาให้แต่ละคาสั่งมันเร็วขึ้นทาให้แต่ละคาสั่งมันเร็วขึ้นเพราะฉะนั้นมันก็เลยเป็นดีเบตกันว่าเฮ้ย
เราใช้ sys isa หรือใช้ risk isa ดีอันไหนดีกว่ากันแล้วถามว่ามีคำตอบหรือเปล่าจริงๆมันมันขึ้นอยู่กับว่าเราจะรันโปรแกรมประเภทไหนเลยอะ่ะคือบางอย่างบางอย่างเราอาจจะต้องการ risk isa แต่แล้วเรา extend เข้าไปให้มัน support เฉพาะแบบตัวที่เราจะใช้เท่านั้นเช่น matrix multiply หรือแบบ linear algebra function บางตัวเท่านั้นก็พออะไรเงี้ยนี่ออกใช่ปะครับอ่ามีคำถามอะไรเพิ่มไหมครับอยากให้อาจารย์ยกตัวอย่างอ่า instruction ที่คิดที่เขาถือว่า complex หรือว่าอ่ามันมี instruction หนึ่งใน Intel x86 เรียกว่า repeat move s เอ่อเดี๋ยวขอกลับไปหน้าเมื่อกี้ก่อนเพื่อความไม่ลกเนาะมันมีคำสั่งหนึ่งที่เรียกว่า repeat move s คือใน x86 อ่ะคำสั่ง move มีใครเคยเขียน assembly มั้ยครับคำสั่ง move ทำอะไรไม่เคยครับอ่าคำสั่ง move เนี่ยมันทำได้หลายอย่างแต่อย่างนี้จะทำได้ก็คือไปโหลด data มาจากแรมไปโหลด array อ่ะเหมือนเราจะต้องการโหลดค่าค่านึงมาจาก array อ่ะในในภาษา C อันนี้คือคำสั่งมันจะใช้คำสั่ง move ในการไปโหลด repeat move s ก็คือเหมือนเราไปโหลดแต่ loop ด้วย loop loop เหมือนติด loop เข้าไปให้บอกว่าจะ move อันนี้กี่ทีในในในคำสั่งเดียวบรรทัดเดียวมันก็จะเหมือนเป็นเกือบเกือบเกือบเกือบคล้ายๆกับโค้ดที่ประมาณแบบ for i เท่ากับศูนย์แล้วก็ ai อันเนี้ยถ้าไปโหลดก็แบบ t เท่ากับ ai อะไรเงี้ยก็ได้หรือแบบ bi แล้วก็ ai ก็ได้ก็คือในคำสั่งเดียวเนี่ยเหมือนเหมือน implement เกือบรูปทั้งรูปเลยแล้วถ้าเกิดเป็น list แทนที่จะมี repeat move s เราก็ต้องไปใช้ jump move ทีละตัวหลายๆครั้งคือคือ list 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 เดี๋ยวขอขอแยกไว้ก่อนแล้วกันเพราะ list เนี่ยมันมีความเออขอขอโทษคือคือใช้ใช้อาจจะใช้คำหยาบถ้านองรับไม่ได้ก็ก็ก็ก็บอกเขาด้วยมันจะมีความกลตีนนิดนึงเพราะว่า list เนี่ยมันต้องเป็น pointer เป็น pointer 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 ใช่ป่ะ workload แบบนี้เขาเรียกว่า pointer chasing ซึ่งเราจะไม่รู้ address อันต่อไปจนกว่าเราจะไปถึงมาถึง block นี้อ่ะเราจะไม่รู้เลยว่า pointer ต่อไปมันชี้ไปที่ไหนอันนี้ส่วนมากส่วนมากไม่ค่อยได้ฮาร์ดแวร์จะไม่ค่อยซัพพอร์ตเพราะว่ามันถึงซัพพอร์ตมันก็ไม่เร็วอยู่ดีเพราะว่าเราไม่มีทางรู้ address อนาคตได้ยกเว้นเราจะ predict อันนี้ก็จะ predict ยังไงก็อีกเรื่องหนึ่งแต่ถ้าเป็นโหลด array อะโหลด array เนี่ยมีหลาย ISA support arm ก็มีโหลดเป็น block เลยถ้าเกิดเราอยากจะทำงานคล้ายๆกับงานของคำสั่งนี้ด้วย CPU ที่ MIPS อะไรเงี้ยครับมันจะใช้คำสั่งหน้าตาประมาณมันจะยาวมันก็จะเป็นอารมณ์นี้เลยโหลด increment จัมกลับมาที่เดิมมันก็คือการลูปลูปเพื่อโหลดโหลดโหลดโหลดโหลดโหลดโหลดโหลดแล้วทุกครั้งที่โหลดเราก็ increment address ไปเรื่อยๆโอเค so any more questions Okay, so if there's no more question, let me transition into the next uh, thing, uh, data type. <laughs> so what's the trade-off between different data types, right? What's the benefit of high-level data types like array, uh, linked list, graph, right? It, it, it actually make you, uh, so if you don't have to convert to like simple thing in the ISA, it's going to be useful to be able to use array inside the ISA, right? The downside is again you have to implement it so it can be annoying. So this is effect of the semantic gap as well, right? Not much discussion here to be honest. We just same topic, change the operation to again data type same concept. If you somehow have to support an array, or if you somehow have to support a graph, right? That can make your hardware more complicated. But Let's say if you have a hardware design just to do graph computation, it might make sense to do that. 
what else are the elements of the ISA? We are transitioning into memory related, related things. Address space, how many unique locations are in the main memory? This region might be for your program. This region might be for your data. This region might be for your page table, right? So these are specified in the ISA. Addressability, can I access each byte? Can I access each bit? Can I access 64 bit in block? Can I access 32 bits in block? And you can see how annoying it can be if it doesn't support a lot of this addressability. For example, here's a quick exercise that I'm going to ask you. You don't have to do this, but please think about this. Can I add to 32 bit number, but with byte addressability? So this is what I do. Byte three. Byte 2, Byte 1, and Byte 0. So I want to add A plus B. And this is A3, A2, A1, and A0. B3, B2, B1, and B0. You cannot go access the whole thing because the ISA doesn't have that support. So in this case, what do you do? How do you add the two number? How, how do I get A plus B? What's the first thing I would do here? Well, I'm going to add A0 plus B0, right? And then I'm going to add A1 plus B1 plus the carry, the carry bit from this. And then you do the same for this B2, uh, A3 plus B3 and B A2 plus B2. The same thing can happen again. If I say I want to add to 8 bits number uh, number but then i can only access thing in the 32 bit granularity in that case you need to make sure you go to the correct byte to do the add right memory organization also have virtual memory support it also have big versus little indian uh everything right everything that you have to do involve how do I process the instruction would be specified in the ISA. Register, which is a fast temp memory inside your ship, will be specified in the ISA. How do I call the register we specify in the ISA? How many do we have is will be specified in the ISA? What's the size of each register will be specified in the ISA? This regi register is a really, really fast temp storage for frequently used data, right? Uh, it it improves data locality. And you might ask, like, what the heck is data locality? We we'll learned this in the second half of the class when we talk about caching. So hold on to this. We will talk about We will revisit and talk about this. And register has its own revolution as well. Back in the day when the circuits are not complicated, you have the what we call accumulator. You can add up and count down and that's it. You can't do A plus B. You can do if you want to do A plus B, you're gonna do A plus plus B times. You can have accumulator and then you can have address register. Now you can interact with the main memory. And nowadays, Forget about these two things. Every single machine would use this, what we call general purpose register. It can be used for any purpose. Think of it as a temporarily variable used for, by the CPU. Used by the CPU. What else are the elements of the ISA? Addressing mode, right? This define how do we obtain the overran, for example, you can have absolute addressing mode, where if you say load R0, 10, it means that I'm going to go to address 10 and put whatever value there into R0. 
this what this is why it's called absolute because treat that number as an address go to that address load that data register indirect when you have this parenthesis around the register name typically it means that go to that register what whatever that data is treat that as the address treat that as the address and load it as zero this uh, displays our base addressing mode means that I'm going to do using R1 as an address and then add the offset, right? Offset plus the value, load the data into R0. And each, each ISA has its own definition on how it works. So go to the manual, go to the manual and read the manual it will tell you exactly how does it work for each isa and for each of the addressing mode they do have trade-offs some of them are more friendly for things like array access some of them are more friendly to be used as a pointer chasing like linked list or graph some of them are better to be used as a sparse data right so it depends on what are the type of the data that you want. You might use one format over the other. And the downside of having more addressing mode is, again, compiler, go do your job, right? So the, there's a lot of tight integration between compiler and architecture because whatever we do is either the job of the compiler to make sure the program run or the architects to make sure the hardware support each instruction and is the balance of the two things, right? So the downside of support more addressing mode is also we have to implement use the transistor to, act, uh, to, to actually support this functionality. So it take more hardware uh, components to support this. What else? The elements of the ISA, you have to specification for how do you do memory map IO, for example, or handle special IO instruction. It also contains things like privilege mode, whether is this uh, accessed by Linux or the OS, or is this a user application? How do I handle exception or interrupts? We will, we will talk about this in detail in a few lectures. Uh, it would talk about the procedures on what what do we do when something goes wrong, right? And what do we do when we have uh, uh, interrupts or vector interrupts? Uh, we also, the ISA will talk about how virtual memory is managed. How do you protect the access or illegal accesses? Instruction also comes in multiple classes. Actually, specifically that three, general three classes. Compute this is operate instruction. So you compute, add, multiply, arithmetic, logical operation. Data movement, uh, load and store instruction. This deals with moving data around between memory and your CPU. Uh, moving data from your IO devices to your CPU. And control, control flow instruction. This deals with any branch or jump in code, right? So what type of command in your program would end up into a control flow instruction? What is a class of things in your program that would generate control flow instruction? Conditional checking, awesome, perfect. So if you have if else or for loop, these would result in control flow instruction because you're jumping around in the code, right? So in short, there are three types, compute, load and store, control flow. As simple as that. Now that we have the three classes of instruction, you can now write a program, right? Another thing is you can have a load store architecture where you 
brings data from DRAM into your register and bring data from register to DRAM. This is prevalent in many of the RISC ISA. Then you can have memory to memory architecture where instruction can operate directly. You can do AI equal BI, the both array, you assign this value from this array into the value in this array. This can be prevalent in many of the CISC ISA. The trade off here is like, again, it's a CIS versus RISC trade off. Complexity of the hardware versus complexity of your compiler. One more thing about the instruction is it also has the length trade off. The length trade off. You can have a fixed length instruction. What does fixed length mean? So, can someone tell me what is your guess? It doesn't have to be correct. What's your guess of the fixed length instruction? So, ah, exactly, thank you. So each instruction has the exact same number of bits. Why is this good? This is easier to decode. And I have to remember to fix the typo here. So it allow you, because if you know how many bytes do my instruction take, right? Let's say every instruction is four bytes. This allow me to actually take in say five instruction in a row because I know exactly where the beginning of each instruction, right? So you can even run things in parallel inside the processor easily, easily. The problem is because it's fixed size, sometimes if you don't need all of them, let's say it's 32 bits long, and you only need 28 bits, you're wasting the additional four bits, right? So this can make your code larger, and this also can be harder to extend. Why is that the case? Because let's say you want to add more instruction, modify the ISA to extend and add more instruction, add more support for new instruction. This would prevent you from doing so because you cannot extend those instructions. You just, you just ran out of bits, right? So this can be harder to extend. One of the major ISA that use fixed length is the RISC-5 ISA. There's a 32-bit format right here and a 16-bit format right here. You will, as you can see here, the RISC ISA would specify bit zero to bit six is the opcode. So you look there first to figure out, okay, What's the old version am I doing? Is it an add? Is it a load? What do we do? Is it a jump or is it a branch? Right. And then there's a different field for source number one, source number two, and destination. So is this a is this a three address machine? The answer is yes or no. You can have source number three too. So this kind of depends on how you design the ISA. As an architect, you have that option to do whatever you want, right? And here's one example of the fixed length instruction. What about variable lengths? Variable lengths would have uh, more compact encoding. So it generally it's gonna result in smaller code size, but it's gonna be annoying when you have to decode and I'll show you why. One example of variable length is the Intel X86 and ARM X86. Let's talk about this instruction called VEX. This VEX instruction, the first byte, the first byte would either be 11000100 or 11000101. So depending on the first byte, you need to then either get one more byte or two more bytes. If it's 0101, then you get eight more bit or one more byte, and then you figure out what do we do? And then if it's one 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 zero 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 one zero zero, which map to the three byte version, 
instead of getting one more byte, you actually get two more bytes and then you figure out what to do. So there are more process into figuring out where do my instruction end? Where do my instruction end? All right. And here's the trade off when you have to decode this process of trying to figure out what does in the instruction do? What does the binary ones and zero, the one that the ones and zero that you see, what that what does they do? They also comes with multiple choices for you to design. Right. You can have uniform decode where the same set of bits represent the exact same thing. The first five bits can be the opcode. The next three bits is for source number one. The next three bits is source number two. So that's uniform decode. Or you can have non-uniform decode, which is easier to extend, more compact, but it make the decoding logic more complicated because you need to figure out, okay, if I look at this bit, are these opcode or are these not the opcode? Right. All right. So let's do another break. We will resume at three o'clock and then I'm going to transition into let's start to design a ship. All right, so we are done with the ISA. I'm going to have a more concrete example of what if I want to design a new ISA? What to do in a bit? But I'm going to first transition into how does ISA work with the microarchitecture? So let's do a quick break, uh, five minutes break. If you have any questions, again, uh, give me three minutes to sip some water. <laughs> I'll be right back and we resume at three o'clock, is that okay? Okay, ha, deo mana.
ับมาแล้วครับมีคำถามไหมครับฮัลโหลได้ยินอยู่ใช่ไหมครับได้ยินครับยังไหวอยู่ไหมผมไปเร็วไปปะครับถามนิดนึงเอ่อส่วนตัวผมรู้สึกเร็วนิดนึงนะครับเดี๋ยวถ้ามีคำถามอะไรรบกวนอาจจะถามถามแบบพิมพ์ชัดทิ้งไว้หรืออีเมลมาถามได้นะครับแล้วก็เอ่อถ้าถ้าสไลด์ไหนไปเร็วรบกวนยกมือบอกอาจารย์หยุดหยุดอย่างนี้เลยได้ผมผมไม่ว่าอะไรนี่หรอกใช่ไหมผมผมแค่อยากคือด้วยด้วยความที่มันเป็นออนไลน์นะ่ะมันมันจะมีเอเลเมนที่ผมอาจจะไปเร็วไปผมผมผมเป็นมันเป็นออนไลน์ปิดกล้องอะ่ะน้องเนี่ยหรอกใช่ไหมครับบางทีเราผมไม่รู้ว่ามันเร็วไปหรือเปล่าแล้วผมเป็นคนพูดเร็วอยู่แล้วมันก็เลยยิ่งไปกันใหญ่เลยเวลาไปเร็วเพราะฉะนั้นถ้าอันนี้ขอความร่วมมือถ้าน้องคิดว่าเฮ้ยตามไม่ทันยกมือเลยแล้วก็ถามน้องยกมือเลยผมผมผมไม่มายอะไรทางนั้นคือพอยคือทําไงก็ได้ให้ให้น้องทุกคนเข้าใจเนาะเออเออ so yeah if I'm going too fast let let definitely please please let me know okay so let's wrap up The last hour of the lecture, so never a fan of three-hour lecture because I feel like for you guys, right? If you have to listen for the lecture for three straight hour on the same topic, like you're dying. And this is the afternoon slot, which means you already had the first three-hour lecture. Uh, so let's continue on to start to talk about the hardware part now that we have the ISA, right? The ISA. Is whatever is the programmer can see when you compile your code in C, in Java, in Python, right? It translate into an instruction, and technically you can modify the assembly. Technically, you can change the 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 assembly code that you got from the compilation, right? These are visible to the programmer, and we call this we call this architectural state. So it's a keyword here. Architectural state means that it is the state of your computer. Let's say I say pause at any given point in my computer. I want to pause everything. Architectural states are the states that the programmer can see. What are these? In the name of all the register, you can program that. It can be the program counter. What is a program counter? Program counter tell you. Sorry. <coughs> sorry. It tells you where is the line you're running right now. So the program counter or the instruction pointer is responsible for. Pointing to that line you're running. Why is that important? Because you need to figure out where is the next line, where is the next line. So the program counter is telling you that. It's also things like what's in the main memory. These are visible to the programmer, right? Programmer can directly see and handle these values. But the hardware also contain many components, which we're gonna learn in this course, that are not visible to the programmer. These are called the microarchitectural state. There's no way for a programmer to access this or to directly control this. What are the example of this? What is the value of my data in certain cache block? We will learn what does cache block mean uh, in the in in a few lectures. What is the intermediate value when I do a five-stage pipeline? These are not visible to the programmer, and if you are worried, like I don't get these example, don't worry about that. 
just understand it as anything that pro programmer has no way to control. These are micro architecture state. So now that we have the ISA, we have a method to command our computer, right? Our computer would take this command and run. Now we are talking about the hardware. It's how we connect all the circuits together and how we can interpret these command of function calls into the, the, the output that we are desirable based on the program. So let's say you have the first architectural state, architectural state one. You run one instruction. That one instruction, what it does is, is simply change the state from architectural state one into architectural state two. That's it. Add R0, R1, and R2 would add the two number together and write the result back to R2. So in that case, the architecture of state two, the only difference between that is now I finish adding one more number, right? But if we have this assumption, this high level model in mind, you run all the assembly code. At the end of the day, when you finish your main function in your program, you are going to reach the desirable output, right? Your computer would produce the correct result. And that's what we need. So what do we expect, right? ISA would specify what should this, the architecture state two looks like given the instruction and the original architecture state, right? What's missing here is in a real computer, there's so many things happening in the middle between AS1 and AS2, right? From the ISA and the programmer point of view, you only see AS1 and then AS2, but you don't see the steps in the middle. There's no intermediate states. The micro architecture is the one that implement how do I change from AS1 into AS2? And that can be any number of intermediate steps in the middle because you have the design choices. You can pick, okay, I'm gonna change from AS1 to AS2 in one single cycle. This is your first lap. Your first lap is based on the instruction that you see, the next clock cycle, apply that. The next clock cycle, apply that. Move to the next instruction, then go through that instruction, one more clock cycle, apply that again. Or you can have intermediate steps, AS1, temp1, temp2, temp3, temp4, AS2. What are the trade-offs, right? What are the trade-offs? Before we discuss about the trade-off, let me go over some background, right? Whenever I say combinational logic, think of this as AND gate or gate. It's the logic gate that together implement an add, a multiply, the function that we want to run. That's it, that's the only, only assumption we, we are going to make in this class. If you want to go into the detail on how do I implement an adder, how do I implement a multiplier, let me know, right? That's extra, that's extra for the context of this class and for the context of like, let's say you want to do architectural research. It's good to know, but it's not, a strict requirement. You can kind of learn in the middle. That's fine. For for the context of this class, just know that whenever we say combinational logic, it's just a bunch of logic gates put together to do certain operation. Sequential logic are the circuitry that allow you to proceed in time. This clock cycle. Go proceed to the next clock cycle. Proceed to the next clock cycle. Proceed to the next clock cycle. It's the logic to actually allow you to proceed in time. That's how you can transition from AS1 to AS2 to AST3. Then you have the clock. What is a clock? What is a clock? Can someone tell me what is the purpose of a clock in your processor? And, and a guess, guess answer is fine. You don't have to tell me the correct answer. Please 
give me your interpretation of what is the clock. Any taker? Exactly, well, that's an awesome answer. It's a, it's a cycle, it one clock cycle, it allows the instruction to be executed synchronously, right? This is awesome, thank you so much. So it allow you to proceed in time in a synchronous way so that you can change the state. It, it allows you to change the state. So the last, the last thing I want to make sure you are aware is there's a limit to how fast you can clock things, right? This is, well, one of the major limit is called the critical path. It's called the critical path. So let's say I have the logic that looks like this. I want to add something and then or and then not and then and with another thing and that's your result. To measure my electron propagate from the source all the way to the destination, it means that I need to give them some time, right? Because I need to make sure electron goes all the way from source to destination. And electron are physical things. They have certain speed. You cannot really, well, you can try to make them faster using different voltage. But it does take time for them to move from one place to another. So critical part is the part in your design that determine how fast you can clock things. If you clock too fast, anyone want to take a guess what happened here? So what happened if I clock it too fast based on my critical path? So if I clock it too fast, right? It doesn't arrive at the this uh, at the at the end, right? So electron would say move from here from here and say, oh crap, I cut it here because the clock cycle is already over. I haven't reached this point yet. So what do we do? And exactly, so your result doesn't arrive. Right? So that determine what? That determine how fast you can clock things, right? One more major factor is power consumption. If you clock things too fast, it's going to consume so much more power. So there are kind of like multiple reasons. The two major ones is the critical part and the power consumption. In this lecture and your lab one, we will talk about how do we process instruction in a single cycle processor. What it means is, for every single instruction in your ISA, right? For a, a, every single instruction in your ISA, I'm going to compute everything and make sure that from AS1, I'm going to make them go through combinational logic and becomes AS2 and clock it so that I have the state, right? So I can show that AS2 is right here. And then keep looping in one cycle, in one cycle, basically. I'm going to move from AS1 to AS2. In this case, what determined the critical part is, is what happened right here, the combinational logic, right? So in a single cycle processor, what determined your clock is the slowest instruction. Because you need to make sure if you have, if the program happened to use that slowest instruction, we give them enough time that within one clock cycle, the electron move all the way to the destination. Right. So the key here is the slowest instruction determine the clock cycle. Is this a good design? So let me ask you this. Is this a good design? You can guess, I mean, it's okay. I'm, I'm gonna expand onto this. I just want interaction, <laughs> that's all. So is this a good design? Mm. 
So let me ask you this. What if I have to access memory or I have to access a disk, right? Then your clock cycles, they're going to have to be able to support those. So it, it means that your CPU is going to be limited to kilohertz processor. <laughs> Who wants a, a, a processor that is one kilohertz? Anyone here want that? The answer is no, right? Uh, the answer is no, but let's, for the purpose of learning, let's first study how it's done because it would be a, a, a baseline for everything else we're going to learn. Right? So this is a good baseline and we're going to improve on this. This comes to the topic, uh, a quick topic. We're going to, we are not going to expand too much right now, but we will expand for sure later. How do we measure performance? All right, let me ask you this. If I have money and I want to buy a new computer, how do I pick between CPU one and CPU two? How do I pick, what do I do? Which one do I buy? How can I measure performance? Any idea? Um, look at the flop, flop specs. Look at the flop, look at the clock, right? So these are good measurement, right? That tells you, okay, flop is likely floating point operation per second. So if I have to do anything with the floating point, higher flop, it's likely to be faster. A clock speed determine how long is one cycle. So a higher clock speed is likely to be faster. So what else? What else can you do? How many people here look at the benchmark number when it run multiple application and figure out, okay, maybe I should buy this versus that when you have to buy a new computer, right? So that's another good way to measure performance. Run an application and see, is it faster, right? So in, in architectural research, that actually one of the common things that we do, we design certain hardware and then you look at the clock cycle. Okay, can we squeeze it even faster now that we have this design, right? Let's try to run a real application and see, okay, is this actually faster? Okay, so these are different techniques that you can use to measure performance. Uh, so what happened in one cycle? If you think about it, instruction are processed in steps, right? From lecture one, I said instruction are in the main memory. Basically, whenever you run a program, the code that you write is stored in the main memory. So if I need to figure out what is the instruction, where do I have to go? Here are the steps. If I have to fetch the instruction, where do I have to go? When I run a program, the program is stored in your DRAM. So if I need to figure out, okay, what's the assembly for this line, line N, where do I have to go? DRAM, yes. So this is called fetching the instruction. You go and figure out, okay, where is the address, right? That has my assembly line that I need to run. The second step is I know the address. I now have the binary. The next step is figuring out that ones and zero. What is that? If I see one, 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 zero, 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 is that an add? Is that a multiply? This is the second step. We call this decode. Once we decode, now we know. Let's say it's add. So let's let's just assume this is add uh, zero, uh, one, and R uh, two, right? The next thing is if you have to do something with DRAM again, you evaluate the address. Otherwise, you fetch the operand. Fetch the operand means that. Now that you're done with this step, right? Now that you are done with this step, you then know, okay, what are the, so with this, with this instruction, add R0, R1, R2, which means that I want to add, uh, so let's, let's assume, let's assume that we want to add R1 and R2 and write the result into R0. Which operand do I get it from? Which one do I fetch? 
how do I proceed with this instruction? You get or what and then get or what? In order to be able to add the two numbers together, which one are you going to get go get it from? Uh, so, so let's assume you are doing R plus R1 plus R2. So let, let's assume this means that Let's assume this means R1 plus R2 equals R0. So you're going to get R1 and you're going to get R2. If our assumption is I'm going to do R0 plus R1 and write the result into R2, then I'm going to go get R1 and I'm going to go get R0. Right? It just depends on how I assume things when I write the ISA. Uh, your answer can be correct. I'm sorry about like changing my assumption throughout the slide now that I realize I changed my own assumption. Then the next step is to execute now that you have R1 and R2. I'm going to just do R1 plus R2, right? And then I'm going to store results. So in this case, what's my target operand? Where do I store my results? I'm going to do R1 one plus r2 and then i'm gonna store store into r0 right and that's it is as simple as this when you have to process the instruction oh evaluating address this is unique to memory instruction for example for example let's say you have to do this load r0 10 r1 this means that i'm gonna take the address at 10 plus r1 put the value here into r0 then you have to evaluate what is that address so in that case this is 10 plus r1 so it involved with memory instruction where i have to go to dram i need to then figure out what's the address all right so does that answer your question cup Okay, awesome. So note that as I as you just asked, right? Sometimes we don't need to do all the steps here. It depends on what is being specified, right? And in the next lecture, in the next lecture, we're gonna talk about this discussion between can we do better? Can we do better than single cycle architecture? And it's called multi cycle architecture, right? So we're gonna skip this. But uh, overall, it's like, okay, we can actually do everything in multiple cycle. Our steps are done across multiple clock cycle. So bear with me. I'm going to move through this slide to go into the next thing. That go back to a single cycle architecture. In the single cycle architecture, now that we have to build the hardware, right? There are two more components. Sorry about so many new terminology. This should be the last one. Data part versus control logic. When you process instruction, what it does is it's going to transform your data D1 into the new data D1 prime. Right? That's it. You change. If you do R1 plus R2, store that into R0, then R0 would change from your old value into the new value. Right? Think of it as a math function. You just do the operation on the data. This is done through the functional unit. Sometimes we call this ALU or arithmetic and logic unit. It is the part of the CPU that perform the task, that, that perform the op uh, operation. The instruction will tell what the operation is. And when you process the instruction, it has two main components. The hardware, the data part is, these are the hardware that make D1 change into D1 prime. So anything that involves the actual action that change from, change the data from D1 to D1 prime, we call this data part. Anything that, oh, sorry. The hardware signal that control the hardware, anything that control the hardware, we call this control logic. We call this control logic. And this control our data part. For example, if I do an add, 
if I do an add and I have in my ALU, I have a unit that do add, multiply, subtract, uh, XOR, and if I have these five options and I know my instruction is doing an add, what does the control logic en uh, enable and which one are they going to be disabling? If I know that I'm doing an add, which one do I trigger? Which one do I send the data to? Which one do I select to make it on? I'm going to select an adder, right? Because I know that my instruction is an add, so I'm going to select an adder to enabling this instruction. So the control logic is the one that make the control. All right, so let me stop here quickly because this is the important slide. Me come have have. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 Data ตัวเก่ามันก็จะถูกแทนด้วย Data ตัวใหม่ไอฮาร์ดแวร์ที่เอาไว้ใช้ในการคำนวณเนี่ยเขาเรียกว่า Data p a ร์ส่วนฮาร์ดแวร์พาร์ทที่เป็นการคอนโทรลว่าเอ้ยตัวไหนเปิดตัวไหนปิดตัวไหนทำอะไรตัวไหนต้องยิมสัญญาณมาจากตรงนี้ไปตรงนี้เขาเรียกว่า Control Control Logic เท่านั้นเองคือคือ Data p a ร์ก็คือพาร์ทที่เป็นฮาร์ดแวร์ที่ทำโอเปอเรชันส่วน Control Logic ก็คือตัวที่มาควบคุมว่าอ่ะสัญญาณวิ่งไปทางนี้นะสัญญาณวิ่งทางนี้เสร็จแล้วเลี้ยวไปทางนี้นะแล้วเลี้ยวไปทางนี้ต่อนะสกระแสไฟวิ่งไปทางนี้ต่อนะอะไรเงี้ยครับเท่านั้นเองเห็นภาพขึ้นไหมครับฮัลโหลโอเคครับโอเค so so that's a, I guess translation into Thai so now at any more questions Because otherwise, I'm going to go to my toy example. And sorry about that animation bug. That should come last. Uh, so I'm going to have a program counter. So what does a program counter do? Again, I just I defined it a few slides back. So what is a program counter? เนี่ยโปรแกรมเคาน์เตอร์มีไว้ทำอะไรครับการตอบให้ it it yes and almost yes actually so it count where we are in the in in your in your program so it points to the current line ก็คือเป็นเป็นเป็นค่าที่บอกว่าตอนเนี้ยเรารันอยู่บรรทัดไหนอ่ะเท่านั้นเลยคือโปรแกรมเคาน์เตอร์มันเอาไว้จิ้มว่าถ้าตัวเลขเป็น20นั่นแปลว่าแปลว่า address ของบรรทัดนี้อยู่ที่ address 20ถ้าโปรแกรมเคาน์เตอร์เป็น1ล้านก็แปลว่า address เรากำลัง run at คำสั่งที่ address 1ล้านใน DRAM ใน DRAM so program counter points to the location in my DRAM right what it means is this provide the address it provide the address into the main memory. So let's say you are running line number n, right? Then this is exactly line number n inside the memory. Then it go and extract that instruction. So the instruction come from the memory goes in here into the decoder. The decoder then figure out, okay, what is this instruction? Let's say it's at uh, 0, uh, 1, and R2, uh, right? The same thing, which is basically means that I'm going to, oops, sorry, I'm going to do R0 uh, equal R1 uh, plus R2, right? So now decoder, okay, is doing an add. Oh, oh so uh, great question. What is IR? This is program counter. This is standing for instruction register. Same thing, the exact same thing. Sometimes I tend to use the word program counter, but sometimes I would switch to instruction register. So if you read older textbook, they would use IR. 
if you should order textbook, this is IR or instruction register. It's the same thing as program counter. So now that instruction now go through my decoder, I know now that I know it's an ad, then I'm going to select. What do I select? What do I select from the register file? So I'm doing R1 plus R2. So which one do I select? I'm going to select R1 and R2, right? Because I need R1 and R2. So I'm going to select R1 and R2. Then the register file would forward the data for R1 and R2. In this case, there can be multiple source going into the adder. So in this case, the select from the decoder, select, whenever you see select here, these are the control logic. It control the how you move the data around. So in this case, you move R1 and R2 from here to your adder, which then add, which then add the two number together. If you have a memory instruction like load and store, sometimes you have to go to your DRAM, but in this case, for the, uh, this example, it's not doing a load and store, so it's doing an add. In this case, your data come, that is coming out is essentially R1 plus R2, right? So now we have an R1 plus R2. What's the next step? Put it to R0. Yeah, write it to R0, which then it means that you, your decoder now has to select R0 from here, right? So that you write into R0. You store them back. And that's it. That, that's complete my instruction. In this case, the last thing that the decoder has to select is what's the next value for the program counter? So in this case, I'm going to just go to the next line. Right, I'm just going to the next line. In MIPS processor, in the MIPS processor in your lab, the next line is the next four bytes because each instruction is 32 bytes. 32 bits, my bad, 32 bits. So you do PC plus four because the starting address for the next instruction is PC plus 32 bits or PC plus four. Right, so. This is kind of like a toy example of your hardware design. We'll go into more detail to explain what happened if I have to add, what happened if I have to load and store, and what happened if I have to jump around in the code in the next lecture. But now that we have the design, let's start with the toy ISA. Let's make some, some ISA that specific for our class, right? This is a makeup ISA is not real, but it would work. So let's say we are using 16 bit instruction to make everything really simple, right? And I have eight register. So we have eight register. To encode the all the eight register, how many bits do I need? Three bits, right? So I can do R0, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, and R7. There are eight options. Lock of eight is three. So I can use three bits to represent my register. And let's assume this. If I see 0, 0, 0, that's R0, 0, 0, 1, that's R1, 0, 1, 0, that's R2, 0, 1, 1, that's R3. 1, 0, 0 is R4, 1, 0, 1 is R5, 1, 1, 0 is R6, and 1, 1, 1 is R7, right? So whenever I see 0, 0, 0 on the field that represents source or destination, I will know that's R0. If I see 1, 0, 0, it means R4. All right, with me so far? Then let's assume it's three address machine. I can do source one, source two, and destination. What do we need? We then need opcode bits, right? 
and the bit that would represent source one and source two, and also immediate bit. So these are basically constant value. And remember, we are building our own ISA. These are not going to be the same as ISA that you've seen in case you've seen other ISA or you started lab one. This is going to be a different ISA just for the purpose of the lecture, right? I want to make things simple. So let's, let's say this is our toy ISA and we focus on this first type alone for now, right? So let's say this is our toy ISA. And I, I would say, let's assume again that the last five to seven bits are the opcode. Oh, oh, okay. So we have eight register, right? That's our assumption. Do you mind if I change this answer in Thai? Uh, yeah, go on. สร้าง ISA ของเราเองสําหรับคลาสนี้โดยเฉพาะเย่แล้วผมก็บอกว่า ISA เราจะมี 8 register 8 ตัวใช่ source 1 source 2 แล้วก็ destination อ่ะคือมันต้องมีจํานวน bit พอที่จะบอกได้ว่า source 1 นี่คือ R0 หรือ R1 หรือ R2 หรือ R3 หรือ R7 ใช่มั้ยเพราะมี register 8 ตัวก็คือเป็น R0 หรือ R7 โอเคแสดงว่า bit พวกนั้น represent address ของ register พวกนั้นใช่มั้ยสมมุติว่า 16 4 bit อย่างงี้ป่ะใช่ใช่โอเคขอบคุณครับโอเคครับ All right so we can do the same thing for the opcode right so we can again assume or ตีต่างว่า code for the add is 000011 so whenever we see this pattern in the last 7 bits 00011 whenever we see this we will know the decoder will know okay that's an add and we can say all oh, zero is a multiply zero 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 one is a subtract we can define our own right so let's just assume that if we see this opcode it's an add if we see opcode for load immediate it's going to be one 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 opcode for a branch if less than is zero 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 one Right. So based on our toy ISA, based on our toy ISA, what is the opcode? What is the not just opcode, but the whole the whole 16 bits for add R0, uh, add R0, R1, R2. So this is destination. This is source one. And source two. So how do what? What is the binary look like? What is the binary look like? What's the opcode for an ad that I just assumed in the last slide? Anyone remember? So if you go back to the last slide, which is, which is here, an ad is zero 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 one one right so my instruction is going to be like this zero 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 one one what else what is source one what is source one here zero zero one because you're talking about r1 so you put in zero zero one what is source two Zero one zero, and what is destination? Zero zero zero. This is going to be the binary that represent this exact instruction. If you somehow go to the memory and see zero 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 one one zero zero one zero one zero 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 zero, it's gonna mean add R zero R one and R two. So for your lab, for your lab, we do you will do the same thing. You will go read at the line, the first line in your program, right? The first line in your program, 
check the bit, check the bits, then check back. It's a giant if else switch case to see, okay, what's the pattern of this bit? What's the pattern of this bit? Is it an add? Is it a multiply? Then you would do a certain thing based on what you see. So let's do a simple add, right? You want to do add R0, R1, and R2. Come back to our example again, right? And this, I'm going to wrap this up. This is going to be the last slide. If you download the PDF from the class website, we have more. We're, we're going to cover that in the next lecture. We'll wrap up with this. Add R0, R1, and R2. This is what you're going to see. So let's assume that this instruction is at address. Uh, 44. So if this instruction is in the address 44, then PC is going to be at 44, which means that I'm going to give address 44 into my memory, right? And that address 44, what is the bit pattern that I'm going to see? What will I see at address 44 if I peek there? It's going to be zero, 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 zero. Yeah, yeah, that add instruction. Um, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and zero, zero, zero. You will see exactly this bit pattern. And that bit pattern would be drawn in here. This will be drawn to the decoder. Decoder would then, okay, I see this bit pattern. The first thing I'm gonna do is to extract the opcode bit. So like, oh, okay, that's an add. Then it would extract source one and source two, right? So you're gonna say, hey, I want R1 and I want R2. R1 and R2 would go in here. Then you will get, right, R1 plus R2 as a result because then adders right here. This go in here and the decoder will say, okay, in this case, I also want to store this into R0. Then you go here and it's like, okay, I want to go to the next program counter. By the way, this is a 16 bit per instruction, not 32 bits. So this is going to be PC plus two. Next address is going to be 46. And then you proceed to run the next instruction. So that's it. That's how you can have a functional single cycle architecture. Any question? Okay. ถ้าไม่มีคำถามถ้าไม่มีคำถามผมให้เวลางงงเพราะว่าอาจจะงงได้ระหว่างนั้นเดี๋ยวผมขออ่าโอเค exactly that's a great question so the actual question is done in the ALU so the question is whether the actual calculation is done in the ALU or not yes they are done in the ALU and that's where the meat is already being actually that's where the meat is right you you want to compute that data the breadth are the process of how do you understand that binary code and make sure that your program run, run line by line by line by line based on whatever your assumption is. But the meat of the computation would be done in the ALU. So that's correct. Any other question? If not, so let me kind of tap tap. Hello. data That data, any tallow as you open single cycle architecture, no, I'll be simple this way. Because you follow that data on my ALU papa. I look good below design, look at the toss I five, who I send home next to I five and what the way. For then, Timon represent Anning work as on that. My girl who pens I five home yet. When the team got a hill register five. แล้ว register file มันจะมีมันจะมีสายไฟเข้ามาอีกเส้นหนึ่งที่บอกว่า 
จะเขียนทับหรือเปล่าแล้วถ้าจะเขียนทับจะไปเขียนทับอะไรอันเนี้ยดีโคเดอร์จะเป็นคนบอกว่าโอเคเราจะเขียนทับนะเราจะเขียนทับ R0 มันคือไอตัว select นะครับ select ทั้งหลายเนะี่ยมันจะเป็นคนบอกว่าเราจะทำอะไรบ้างอันนี้คือที่ผมพูดก่อนหน้านี้พี่ว่า control part control logic อะ control logic เป็นคนกำหนดว่าโอเคเดี๋ยวเราจะเขียนทับนะเราจะเขียนทับ R0 อันนี้ไม่น่าจะเห็นเห็นภาพขึ้นไหมครับหรือว่ายังงงอยู่เห็นเห็นขนาดยังไม่ค่อยได้ครับก็คือแต่แต่อย่างน้อยได้แล้วใช่ไหมว่า Data ที่ออกมาจาก ALU คือ R1 บวก R2 ครับอ่าแล้วสเต็ปสุดท้ายคือเราต้องการเอาค่าเนี้ยเขียนทับ R0 ใช่ไหมใช่อ่าโอเคก็คือเดี๋ยวขอเปลี่ยนสีเป็นปากกาเป็นสีเสียละเดียสีสีแดงแล้วกัน R1 บวก R2 ถ้าเราเขียนทับเราต้องเอาค่านี้วิ่งไปที่ไหนต่อต่อสายไฟไปที่ไหนเพื่อที่จะให้มันมันมี Input เป็น R1 บวก R2 ก็ต้องวิ่งเข้าไปที่ Register File ใช่ไหมครับเพราะว่านั่นคือที่ที่ R0 อยู่ใช่อ่าเสร็จแล้วไอ้ Register File อ่ะคือถ้าถ้าสมมุติเราไปเรียนคลาสพวกแบบ Digital Design ที่เอาไว้ Implement Circuit อ่ะ Register File มันจะมันจะมี Input หลายอันเดี๋ยวผมขอขอกระดึบไปสไลด์ต่อไปนิดหนึ่งนะเดี๋ยววาดให้ดู <coughs> ขอโทษขอโทษ Register File ผมจะใช้ตัวย่อเป็น RF แล้วกันเนาะคือมันจะมีพอร์ตใช่ไหมคร่าวๆก็คือเป็น Data Input แล้วก็อีกอันนึงเขาจะชอบเรียกกันว่า Write Enable แล้วก็ Data Output แล้วก็อันนี้จะเป็นเป็น Select อะ Select ว่าจะจะเอา Input ตัวไหน R0 หรือ R1 หรือ R2 หรือถ้าเราจะเลือกว่า Output จะต้องการให้ Output ของ Register File อ่ะส่งค่าอะไรคืออย่างกรณีเมื่อกี้ที่เป็น Add Add R0 R1 R2 อันเนี้ย R1 กับ R2 จะเป็น Output จริงปะครับเพราะว่ามันคือค่าที่เราต้องการหยิบออกมาจาก Register File เพราะนั้น R1 กับ R2 เป็น Output อันนี้อันนี้ยังยังตามทันอยู่ปะครับทันครับอ่ะคือตัวเนี้ยตัวเนี้ยเราต้องการ R1 กับ R2 คือสมมุติมีเดมีสองพอแล้วการมี Data เอา1กับ Data เอา2เดี๋ยวเราต้องการ R1 กับ R2 แล้วขากลับออกมาพอมันบวกกันเสร็จแล้วขากลับออกมาตอนเนี้ยคือเราจะต้องการค่า R0 ใส่กลับเข้าไปใช่ไหมไอตอนเนี้ย Data in ตรงเนี้ย Data in ตรงเนี้ยมันจะคือลบนิดนึงคือมันก็พอพอมันผ่าน ALU ปั๊บอะตรงนี้จะกลายเป็น R1 บวก R2 วิ่งเข้ามาเป็น Data in ใช่ไหมเมื่อกี้จำตามที่เราวาดไว้อะคือพอมัน Data ออกมาจาก ALU มันก็จะถูกเสียบกลับเข้าไปที่ Data in แล้ววิธีการเขียนเข้าไปใน R0 นะไอตรง select in อันเนี้ยเราก็จะบอกว่าเป็น R0 ก็คือ0 0 0นี่แหละ0 0 0เสร็จแล้ว write enable เนี่ยเราจะให้ค่า input เป็น1ถ้า write enable เป็น1ปั๊บถ้า write enable เป็น1ปั๊บใน register file อ่ะมันจะไปเขียนค่าเอา data in มาทับค่าเก่าตามทันหรือเปล่าอันนี้อันนี้ทันครับอะไรนะครับอ๋อทันครับเออเอออันนี้ก็คือว่า register file ถ้าถ้าดูใน logic จริงๆแล้วมันทำงานยังไงก็คือพอเราได้ input มาเสียบปั๊บมันก็จะมีอีก signal อีกตัวหนึ่งที่บอกว่าเราจะเขียนทับแล้วนะแล้วก็บอกด้วยว่าจะเขียนทับอะไรแล้วเราก็ใส่ให้ถูกไว้อย่างกรณีก็บอกว่าเขียนทับ R0 แล้วในคล็อกต่อไปพอมันคล็อกปั๊บเนี่ยไอ้ลอจิกเนี่ยมันจะเขียนค่าทับไปให้เราเลยโอเคแค่นั้นแหละครับครับคอมทัยโอเคครับอ่ะดีแล้วดีแล้วมีคำถามอย่างนี้รบกวนถามเลยนะครับเพราะว่าบางอย่างอะ่ะคือผม abstract ให้มันให้มัน high level เพราะว่ามันจะได้ไม่ต้องรู้ circuit เยอะแต่ถ้าถ้าเป็นคำถามที่ต้องอธิบายแล้วจะทำให้เข้าใจขึ้นเนี่ยก็ต้องถ้าผม recommend ให้ตามเพราะว่ามันมันทุกอย่างมาอธิบายได้มันแค่แบบบางทีผมไม่แน่ใจว่าต้องอธิบายพาร์ทไหนดีพาร์ทไหนไม่เข้าใจพาร์ทไหนเข้าใจแล้วขอบคุณมากครับ alright any more questions because I kind of want to before we leave right we have about uh, 10 minutes left 
Uh, before we leave today, I want to ask if you have any question about two things. First is a project, right? So you have a choice of using our lab, our lab assignment, as I said, right? You can extend it so to, to be able to simulate fancy things that we learned from this class, right? So this can be a possible uh, default project, like do extend your lab code to support multi-core, uh, to have the main memory or to do fancy branch prediction or use a better caching policy or or if you have any existing projects or if you are interested in anything let me know so that we can iterate over what would be a good project for you uh the earlier is the better right earlier is the better so i can kind of like guide you on okay if you want to work on this project maybe start with uh reading these material in case you need more background so that you can start working on a project. So I do encourage you to uh, let me know of your interest about your class project. Uh, lab number one, you're going to write a simple MIPS simulator. Uh, it would support not all, it's just a common instruction. Uh, I need to, I guess, for for the sake of making sure you are aware, this is the same lab that uh, when I TA for the class, this is the 447, it's like undergraduate architecture class at the uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this is the material that we use for the first lab. Uh, please keep in mind that you're gonna use this code for lab number two. <laughs> so, so make sure it works and make sure it's relatively neatly written because if you need to modify your own code you know exactly where to modify them because we're going to pipeline this to make it faster in lab number two and here's the guide here's the guide first uh when you when you uh i, I guess compile your not compile but but uh basically generate the bits, the binary file from the assembler. Make sure you delete the first line. That has the at. Once you have the .txt file, you you know when you try it. Once you have the .txt file, delete the first line, then the starter code will be able to read that. Then the second step is uh, kind of like go through our toy. ISA plus the design that we have in this class to figure out how to extract, right? Basically, most of the work for the first lab is, okay, I see this bit pattern. Is that an add? Is that a multiply? Okay, I'm going to explain this in Thai. So, in lab, อ่ะครับก็คือพอเราได้บายนารีมาใช่มั้ยเราก็จะเอ่อเจอออฟคอร์สเสร็จปั๊บเราก็ไปเทียบว่าเออเจอออฟคอร์สอันนี้แล้ว
and then you can run it on a simulator and you see the changes for one line to the next line to the next line and you also see how these code are being stored on a uh, on a simulator and how the simulator process each line all right so that's the end of the class today any last minute question มีคำถามอะไรเพิ่มไหมครับโอเค great a uh, great question uh so i will get back to you so i'm gonna make hmm how about this so should i make an is it okay if i make an announcement about okay, okay here's the sample review and here are the uh what i would care about in the review is that okay เดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวผมจะโพสตตัวอย่างเข้าไปใน announcement ครับได้ไหมครับ Alright uh, any other question um, ขอถามเพื่อภาษาไทยนะครับได้ครับเอ่อผลรอนันตามนี้มีผลติดที่ข้อถามมาคือผลนันผลนันนันที่ถอนที่เป็น a m t o k นะครับเราก็นำไม่ออกมาเป็นหลอกเอะครับอ่าอ่าอ่าอ๋อมันคือพาร์ทที่ผมบอกให้ลบบรรทัดแรกอะบรรทัดแรกมันจะมีแอดแอดติ่งอยู่หนึ่งบรรทัดลบอันนั้นออกแล้วมันจะรันได้ครับผมครับอ่าลองลองดูลองดูถ้าถ้าเปิดเปิดไฟล์นั้นเข้าไปที่มันเป็นแบบพอมันเป็นเฮกแล้วอะถ้าจําไม่ผิดมันจะมีแอดอะไรสักอย่างอยู่บรรทัดแรกให้ลบทิ้งโอเคครับมีคำถามเพิ่มไหมครับโอเคถ้าไม่มีเดี๋ยวขอเอ่อ wrap up คลาสนี้ก่อนเนาะขอบคุณมากนะครับทุกคนน้องน้องน้องที่เป็น volunteer รบกวนโหลดโหลด recording ให้ผมหน่อยเดี๋ยวผมเอาไปโพสแล้วก็ส่งเป็น playlist กลับไปให้ได้ไหมครับผมโหลดไม่ได้ได้ได้ครับเดี๋ยวตั้งนอาจารย์ได้อีเมลผมไปยังครับที่เป็นวิดีโออันแรกเออเออใช้อีเมลวิดีโออันแรกได้เลยหรือหรือเอ่อเป็นในในแคนวัสก็ได้ในแคนวัสในซิลลาบัสผมมีอีเมลอยู่ในนั้นก็อันเดียวกันแหละใช้ได้ทั้งคู่หมายถึงว่าผมผมส่งอีเมลของวิดีโอครั้งแรกครับเข้าไปในเข้าไปในอ๋อส่งมาแล้วฮะใช่ครับโอเคขอบคุณมากครับเดี๋ยวผมลองไปเปิดดูครับขอบคุณมากครับโอเคครับขอบคุณมากนะครับครับสวัสดีครับโอเคงั้นแค่นี้ก่อนนะครับเดี๋ยวผมเอ่อเลิกปิดแชร์สกรีนเนาะแล้วก็มีคำถามอะไรถามในอีเมลได้เลยขอบคุณครับงั้นเดี๋ยวเจอกันสัปดาห์หน้าครับขอบคุณครับครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับ